Praise the Lord. Welcome to Cross Time with Pastor Curtis this morning. We're glad to be here with our Bibles open before us. We have been studying the book of Ephesians, rather the letter to the uh, church at Ephesus and to the faithful who are in Christ Jesus is what Ephesians 1 and 1 declares that this letter was written to us as well because we're the faithful in Christ Jesus and God's church, the born-again, blood-bought people of God. And uh, today is the 11th of August, 2017. This is session 40. We've been teaching the book of Ephesians since last October, so about 10 months now. And I believe today we will probably make it out of chapter 5, possibly. Uh, And we just uh, are excited to be here. Before we dig into the Word today, don't forget about the book we're offering, All God's Works Are Done in Truth. It is uh, brought to us. Uh, I wrote the little booklet, 62 pages, uh, concerning Psalms 33 and 4 that declares the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. And as we've learned the truth is Christ and him crucified. This little book will help you in your walk with the Lord as the Holy Spirit is able to reveal the truth of God's word to you in the narrowness of that it is written in so get yours fifteen dollars get yours send to thecrosswaychurch.com or send your money to the address you see here on the screen if you can't see it at 610 highway 59 queen city texas 75572 we're excited about the little booklet it's changed lots of lives the message is being preached for the last five years with that scripture tied to them and we're just blessed to know that jesus is the truth And what made him the truth to us is what he did at Calvary, and that's what God works in. Praise God. We're also asking for help uh, concerning the the ministry uh, going into the Philippines. Uh, It's it's an opportunity for one hour every night of the week for this gospel that we preach to be able to go into the Philippines. And with your support, I believe we're going to be able to make it happen. It's $900 a month, so I'm asking for your support in getting this gospel that the Apostle Paul and we preach to the world to be able to go into that nation and just to rip up the work of the devil, save the lost, and to bring the saved to a place of living in the knowledge of their salvation, the power of their salvation. I'm asking for your support in that, and praise God for all of you that do help us in that matter. One more thing before we get into the Word this morning. Please get your Bibles, follow along. Don't just sit there doing two or three other things and and watching the broadcast. Make sure you're a part of the broadcast. Pay attention. God wants to speak to you today and any time during the broadcast, if you're watching by way of Facebook Live, make sure you share the message when it's over. Your friends, your relatives, your co-workers, all those people, if you're not ashamed of the gospel, make sure you share this message. Praise be to God. Ephesians chapter 5, I believe where we left off last time, we've been gone for two weeks, we're glad to be back. And uh, where we left off was Ephesians 5 and 26. So I'll read Ephesians 5 and 25 until we get to 27 where we're headed this morning. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. As we dig into the Word today, let us take a moment to ask our Heavenly Father to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to be uh, that would understand the Word, that would desire to hear something from the Lord today. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we stand before you today cleansed by the blood, bought with that awesome price of that precious blood of Jesus Christ, We ask for hearing today. We ask that faith would come and quicken our inner man, that we would have ears to hear, Lord, and our hearts would desire to know the Word of God in truth and that the truth would come today and cause us to walk in freedom and to love you more and to trust you more. So we're asking for a greater revelation of Jesus and what he accomplished for us on the cross, and we're asking it in his name Amen. Praise God. So we see the Bible here in verse 25 telling the husbands to love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 
It, it, and, and this is really what Paul is writing here by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about husbands and wives, Christian husbands and Christian wives, not worldly anything. The instruction is to a godly Christian husband, a godly Christian mother and wife. And so that's what the instruction is given for. But as he's going to begin to break it down and show us that he's really speaking of Christ and the church as a mystery that that is. But he's also giving instruction to the marriage, the folks of the marriage. So, and we're going to see some things today in the word that I hope will bless you as it's blessed me. But God tells us in his word, and I'm a, I'm a Bible believer. I have to say that I'm a Bible believer. I don't care what Oprah says. She's not even saved. I don't care even what most preachers say because most today are not referring to God's word in truth, which means based on and in the context of what Christ did for us at Calvary. So I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, whether it's directly to me or I'm listening to preachers who are preaching the message of the cross using God's word where I can receive the revelation of Christ because that's what the word of God is given to us for. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, praise God. So he tells us husbands to love our wives just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for. See, this is a love that we are to love our, our wives with. But listen, it's not just our loves that we've derived. It's not just the way we feel. It's not when we feel good or when we don't feel good. It's not based on that. It's based on the love that Christ had for us. That is the only love that I can truly love my wife with. And he loved me so much, he gave himself for me. And as husbands and wives, we're going to have to learn to submit to one another. Amen. We're going to have to learn to submit one to another, not just the woman to the husband and the husband to the wife. We're talking about, if you, if you go back a few verses, and let me see where this is, and let's cover this while we're passing. Verse 21 tells us, the marriage, the husband and the wife, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In the fear of God means in the value of who he is. And we see the value of who he is by what he's written in his word to us to reveal himself to us and his, his way for us. Everybody said amen. The Word of God is to reveal God to us and to reveal God's way to us. And if we have the fear of God, that means simply that we're submitted to Him by being submitted to His way, which is told us in the Word. If we're going our own way, contrary to the Word, we're not submitted to God, and therefore we can't be submitted to each other properly as husband and wife. And somebody said, Amen. This is a very important teaching because this is the process for a successful, a victorious, a, a marriage that literally is symbolic of Christ's relationship with the church. Amen. And we're going to see a little bit more of that today. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You got men and women uh, gallivanting, gallivanting all over the countryside thinking they have a, a, a ministry uh, that is a, a marriage. They give marriage seminars and all they do is tell men and women what they should do and how they should smile and hold hands. And, how they, and, and those things just come naturally if you love each other. But listen, if you want to have a victorious, a triumphant, a marriage that is symbolic, bib, a biblical Christian marriage, which is a marriage symbolic of Christ and his church, the relationship he has with his church, then you're going to have to follow God's plan of what he said. Husbands, you're going to have to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That much you're going to have to love your wife to the point of giving yourself to her. Amen. Praise God. That he might, he's talking about Jesus now, that Jesus might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. We're talking about a sanctified marriage. There's, it's one thing to be in a, in a marriage. It's one thing to be Christians and be married. But it's an entire different thing to be in a, in a process and walking in a marriage that is sanctified by the Lord. A Christian is sanctified the moment they're born again. 
You are set apart for God's use. That's what the word sanctification means. You're set apart the moment you're born again to be used by God, molded and shaped by God for His purpose, not your own. For His purpose. And your marriage is for His purpose, not your purpose. Amen, Brother Curtis. Praise God. So the, it, it, what God is looking for is a marriage, a Christian husband, a Christian wife who are sanctified to the Lord. Now, I know the process is broken if you're married to an unbeliever. If, even if you're married to someone who claims to be a believer but just refuses to walk after the counsel of God, you're not going to be able to experience what I'm teaching today. I know and you can't go around it. You can't say, bless God, I'm going to experience it. No, we're talking about a godly man and a godly woman. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of marriages in the church today where one is not saved and the other one is. And I, and, and I hate that, but there's going to be major struggles. You, you as the saved husband or the wife, whichever one you might be, you will be able to experience the presence and the power of God, but never as a marriage because that other individual, that husband or that wife, is not sanctified for the Lord. They're not set apart yet because they're not born born again or even if they claim to be born again they refuse to walk in that place where God has set them apart to be able to form them shape them mold them and it's obvious because they won't obey God's word they just keep doing what they want to do when they want to do it why they want to do it how they want to do it and with who they want to do it they still think they're their own at the same time confessing to be the Lord's. That is not a sanctified marriage. It won't work, but thank God he'll still honor you. He'll still bless you. He'll still pour his spirit out on you. But the marriage will never be able to represent, be uh, able to be symbolic of that marriage, of that relationship between Christ and the church. And so that's why it's so important not to go into any situation and be unequally yoked because once you're in it, you're in it. And you're, and you're stuck in it. Amen. So it's very important to pay attention to the Lord and His plan when you're seeking someone to marry. Because your marriage is supposed to be required to be. Not an option. Supposed to be symbolic of Christ's relationship with the church. Amen. It's important. It's very important. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, let me tell you something. The, 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 the marriage of the husband and the wife here and now, the Christian husband, the Christian wife, it, there's supposed to be a fruit-bearing process taking place. When there's a marriage, there's supposed to be a fruit-bearing process. One of those fruits is children. Another, but, but, that, but that's not really the most important fruit. The most important fruit is the fruit of the spirit of that marriage, which shows that Christ is the head of this marriage flowing through the husband into the wife, down into the children. Praise God. Hallelujah. The, 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 the fruit is, sure, it's children. That's the fruit that God brings men and women in. They're intimate. The uh, children are born. And, but listen, that's not really the most important fruit. The most important fruit, as I've said, is being able to represent Christ as husband and wife. And your marriage is symbolic of Christ's relationship with his church. So let's look at Romans chapter 7. I believe it's verse 4 that talks about the fruit of marriage. And it's the, it's the spiritual marriage. When we're born again and we become the body of Christ. Watch this, Romans 7 verse 4. I'm not teaching on this. I'd love to, maybe later. Romans 7 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by through the body of Christ means when you got born again, you became dead to the law, and now you're able to marry someone else. When you're lost, you're married to the law. When you're born again, you've been divorced to the law. You've been become dead to the law, and now you've married someone else. Watch this. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Why? That we should bring forth fruit unto God. Marriage, whether it's natural marriage here on the earth, 
or our spiritual union, our, us being Christians and married to Jesus, the bride of Christ, it's all about bringing fruit to God. Our marriages are about bringing fruit to God. Individually, I'm married to Jesus, and I am now able to bring fruit to God, and that is why I am born again. Not just to get to heaven, I am born again to represent the one who saved me now. To bring fruit unto God as I allow him to work in me and change me. Hallelujah. Because I'm no longer dead under the law. Now I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus and able to bear fruit because I'm married to a new husband. Amen. And so when we're married as Christians, our, our marriages should be bringing fruit unto God symbolically representing again Christ's relationship with his church. The Bible says in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it. He's talking about what Christ does to the church with the washing of water by the word. We're already set apart. Now as we march to Zion, as we head toward the rapture, the second coming of Christ, as the body of Christ, we're being cleansed daily by the washing of the word. Hallelujah. We're being cleansed daily. We, we're not among those that teach that, 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 that because Christ is our sanctification, that even our condition now is sanctified and we're all perfect now. That's only in Christ positionally. That is not conditionally. They are just liars and they're lying to themselves. Their marriage cannot even be what it's supposed to be living that life. Oh, it's all a make-believe world to them, just like the word of faith. But it's all, it's not true. It's not real. It's like, the, it's like the person that claims as a woman that they're really a man, that God made a mistake on them. No, they're playing make-believe. Make believe, and know this, you'll never be able, listen, women who marry women, men who marry men, they, they, they cannot submit to one another biblically. It's over for them. They're out of the will of God until they're born again and they, and they admit, yes, I'm a woman. Yes, I'm a man. No matter what I feel like, no matter the lie that came to me, because unless, I, unless there is a female and a male submitted one to another, they're outside of the submission process, first of all, to God. Therefore, their submission to one another is not of God, and he can't bless that because it's not of his will. Amen. Praise God. Simply put. So if, we're, if, if our marriage is here, we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That means our marriage is to be sanctified, representative of Christ, his relationship with the church is going to have to be a marriage that is sanctified. I ain't talking about, yes, we're sanctified. I'm talking about living in the sanctified life, hallelujah, where the word of God is the lamp to our feet and the light to our path where we live as man and woman in one union according to the word of God and that means by faith amen that's called sanctification process our marriages sh shouldn't have us growing further apart but closer together Amen. We're to be coming closer and closer to Jesus, more intimate with him as the perfect day approaches. You and I are, should be drawing near unto the Lord more and more. Amen. Every day. And the same with our marriages, praise the Lord. Watch this in verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now here he's talking about the church, but he's also talking about marriage. He's trying to bring forth the revelation, as we'll see in a few minutes. He's trying to see, show us that through the marriage, we should be able to see the revelation of Jesus. How many of you know that God, <clears throat> even before sin came into play in the Garden of Eden, God, everything God had already done for man, even the creation of earth, the way he created it and said, let there be light, all was symbolic of what he would do later because of his son. 
When we were born again, God said to us, let there be light. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. When we believed in Christ, God said, let there be light on that believer. And Christ shined in our hearts. Hallelujah. Praise God. Everything God has done, even from the very beginning, Isaiah 46, 10 says he's declared the end from the beginning. And that means his beginnings of all dealings with men. Even the things he was doing before we fell in to sin what could be looked at as, as prophetically and symbolically of, of what Christ would come and do for us at the cross. Even making man and woman and calling them one flesh, as we'll see, was all representative of what Christ would one day do because of our sin and join us, reconcile us back to God as one flesh. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. He's always had his mind on what he would do for us, not against us. We don't want God against us. That's called wrath. God for us, the experience of God for us is grace. Amen. Amen. I appreciate the questions I receive by email and messenger on Facebook and text by people every day of my life asking me questions. Yesterday there was a question that came from someone that said, I understand you're teaching now that God's grace is God at work, but... Uh, when, what is it when, when, when God is against us? Is that still grace? Uh, the answer is no, that's not grace. God's grace is God working for us, imparting in us, doing things for us, through us. Hallelujah. The, the good things, the benefits of the covenant of God. If God is working against us, there's a word for that. It's not called grace. It's called wrath. God's wrath is against all. It's revealed from heaven against all who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Amen. So it's not grace, it's wrath. There's two, uh, you know, when you got born again, you came out from under the wrath of God, and now His grace is towards you. Praise the Lord. So the Bible says again in verse 27 that He might present it to Himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We have been sanctified. We have been made the holy. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That is a set uh, judgment of God. That is our position in Christ. But you and I, as husbands and wives, as, as single people, even as Christians uh, without a husband, right? we are walking in this sanctification process. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that every man should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That means it's not a done deal. It's a done deal for the provision for us to be able to have and walk in. But it's not a done deal and it's all said and complete and we're just holy now. Glory. We're not that. If we were, we wouldn't need the New Testament instruction. We would never need to be corrected. We would never need to be convicted. But I got news for you. I need to be convicted every day. I need to be corrected every day because I still don't know everything. I'm still not just like Christ. But I am being made conformable to his image, praise God. And it's through the sanctification process. And our marriages have to go through that. Amen. If you've been married very long at all, you know there's problems because you have to live together. You have to deal with her. She's got to deal with you. You've got to submit one to another. You've got to give a little. She's got to give a little to get down through another day. Amen. And if Jesus is the middleman, praise God, if he's over that marriage, you're going to be able to love each other, submit to each other, uh, deal with each other properly, which is in the sanctification process, so that we're continually walking in what the Bible says without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing, and that we should be holy and, with, and without blemish. Amen. When God sees his people walking, not in some already perfect and they have no flaws right now, when he sees them faith, their faith in the one who is perfect and what he did because he loved the church, gave himself for it, 
then he sees a marriage walking in a place without spot or wrinkle. Do you know when God uh, told the people of Israel, just put the blood over the doorpost, and when I pass over, if I see the blood, I'll just pass right on over. God didn't say, I'm going to look in every house to see who's perfect, who's got it all together. He said, if I see the blood, and we're talking about the only thing that sanctifies the Christian in the born-again experience is their faith in the blood. The only thing that sanctifies the marriage is the blood of Jesus. Amen. So if you got a, a husband that's believing in the word of faith and a wife who's got their faith in the cross, well, praise God for her, but the marriage can't walk in a sanctified place. Not in unity, because her faith is right, his faith is in something that's not of God, and therefore the marriage cannot be sanctified. And let me say it again, if you're not married, you better guard your heart and not just take the first Johnny that comes along, the first Susie that comes along, and say, oh, this must be of God. You better not take nobody into yourself until you know they love God and their faith is in the cross of Christ and they're hungry for the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't care if you have to wait 20 years for a husband. You'd be better waiting than you would in something God could not bless. He says in verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Why is that? As we'll see later in Scripture, that when you marry someone, you become one with them. You're, you're, you're not, in the eyes of God, you are one. Although you are one, you are one. But in the eyes and the plan of God Almighty, He sees you as one. Amen. One. Right. You become one. Right. And if you don't love your wife, you don't love yourself. Right. And I got news for you. If you don't love yourself, you got big problems. And I know we don't hear that very much, that you're supposed to love yourself. And I'm not, God's not here not talking about, oh, I just love myself. He ain't talking about that. He's talking about you take care of yourself. You, you tend to your needs. You make sure you get fed. You make sure that you are clean. You make sure that you are not doing this. It's that you tend to yourself. He's talking about that kind of love, that, that tending to yourself. You care about yourself. And he says here, men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You take care of yourself. You get up at night talking about the lost world out there don't know how to bathe and, and how to dress right. We're, this is to Christians. Christian men tend to themselves. They carry themselves right. They dress appropriately for the situation. They, they talk right. They carry themselves. They, they tend to themselves. So, and he's telling the men here again, he, men, you're getting instruction here that you and I need from the Lord. Not only to make our marriage work, listen, for each other, but there's a higher order and a higher reasoning for this. And again, I'll say it, it's because our marriages should be representing Christ and his relationship with the church. And if I care about that, I'm going to walk in God's word, his way. Yeah. And I'm being told that I ought to be loving my wife as I love my own body. As I tend to my body, I keep my body clean, I dress my body, I make sure if it's got a boo-boo, I do everything I can to keep it from hurting. So, he that loves his wife loves himself. Remember, when you get married, you're one. If you don't love her, you don't love yourself. If you don't care about her, you don't really care about yourself. Men and women who don't treat each other right means they don't care about each, they don't even care about themselves. Amen. And again, this week I'll bring that scripture out as I did uh, the last time we met. First Peter three seven says this. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them, talking about your wives, according to knowledge. That's talking about what we're reading, the knowledge of God. Giving honor unto the wife, honoring her as your wife. She's your wife. She's a gift from God to you. As unto the weaker vessel. Honor her as the weaker vessel. 
and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Did you get that? Heirs together of the grace of life. Watch this. That your prayers be not hindered. Oh, we need to know that. We need to highlight that. If I'm not treating my wife right, it's because I really don't care about myself. Therefore, my prayers are in vain because I really don't care about me. Think about that. If, and we're, we're talking about what God says. If I don't treat my wife right, that means I really don't care about myself. And if I don't care about myself, why am I wasting my time praying anyway? My prayers are because I do care about me. God help me. God deliver me. God give me direction. Oh, I need your help, Lord. But if I'm not treating my wife right, means I really don't care about me, so my prayers are in vain. God sees me loving my wife as Christ loved the church, and, and I'm in this thing. I'm, I'm trusting the Lord for my marriage, and I'm honoring her as the weaker vessel. I'm submitting to her. She's submitting to me. And because we love each other, we're walking in this thing together, letting God make it work because we can't. And our faith being in the cross, that only thing that God, the death of Christ, let me clarify that, the only object we can have that allows the Holy Spirit to keep our marriage and to keep it sanctified before Him. Now think about this. What we've learned this morning, just from the Scriptures, is that if I don't care about my wife enough to treat her right, then it means I don't care about myself. And that's why my prayers are in vain. It's not because God says, I see you treating your wife bad, I'm not listening to you. The reality is, I'm not treating my wife right. And that makes me really, I don't really care about myself. Now, we're not talking about what you say. We're talking about the way God sees it and the way it really works. You see, the way God sees it is the only way it will work. And when God says, if you do this, it won't work, that means it won't work even if you say it is working. So if I don't treat my wife right, the reason my prayers are hindered is because they're in vain. I'm asking God to help me, and I don't even care about myself. Oh, I say I do. I, Lord, help me. I need help. I, I, can't you see? I care enough about myself to ask you, but I've forgotten that my wife is also who I am. We're one in this. We're one. And we'll see that in Scripture. And, the God, and God has told me that if I don't, Love her right. If I don't treat her right, my prayers will be hindered. And I've told you already, and I'll tell you again, the reason they're hindered is because in all reality where God says, if I, I ought to love my wife as my own body, he that loves his wife loves himself. If I care about myself, that means I care about my wife because she is not just in this with me, but we are one unit in the eyes of God. I hope you're getting something out of this this morning. And he says in verse 29, Because no man ever yet has hated his own flesh. Now that's not talking about we hate our sinful flesh. He's talking about here tending to who we are. In the flesh, we have to live in the flesh. I'm not talking about in the sinful flesh. I'm talking about just how we have to eat, we have to bathe, we have to go to work, we have to all these things we have to do just as people. Just as people. And he says here, because no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but what he does, he nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord does for his church. You know, I've got a 30, a, a son that'll be, and I've never shared this on camera in the pulpit. I'm going to this morning. Hopefully it'll help some of you. I've got a, a son that's about to be 31 years old. He has nothing to do with me. About four years ago, close to that, three years ago maybe, somewhere between there and four, he, I, he called me, and just out of the blue, never has anything to do with me at all, no happy Father's Day, no happy birthday, no nothing, and if that's what he wants to do, that's between him and God, it grieves my heart for him, but uh, I co-signed for him a car, he paid for it for just a little bit, and then he just stopped paying for it, and we got stuck with it. 
And every time I start thinking negative thoughts about that, the Lord reminds me that I treated him the same way. That I just, I just abuse God sometimes. I just, he's got his word here. I'm supposed to live according to it. This is the contract of God for his children of God. And sometimes I just close the contract and say, I'll do what I want to do. Those of you who are married know what I'm talking about. You just get in the flesh sometimes. Say things you shouldn't. Do th- things you, some things you shouldn't. Act some ways you shouldn't act. And you know the way you're acting and things you're saying, things you're doing, is just not in the contract written in heaven for your marriage. Can I get a witness? Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. But God, God convicts me that when I start having negative thoughts about that, that I'm still to love, I'm still to forgive, I'm still to go on. Hallelujah. And that's what happens in a marriage. If, you know, the reason the divorce rate in the church is as high as the world's divorce rate is because the church, the marriages in the church don't know the sanctification process. Listen, if you're sitting under somebody not preaching the cross, your marriage, you're just struggling. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've been married 50 years and you're just all proud of all that. If your faith is not in the cross, it's just y'all working and you know you're miserable. And you're just sustaining. You know deep in your heart you'd have got away from each other a long time ago if it wouldn't have been such horrible consequences in the community and your name going down in the dirt. But you know your marriage is not working. You spend more time out in the shop than you do with her, and she wants to go shopping with her buddies more than she wants to be with you. That means it ain't working, my friend. Nothing wrong with the shop. Nothing wrong with shopping. But if you ain't wanting to spend more time together, it ain't working. Because if it's working, you're wanting to spend more time together, praise God. So we have to tend to those things. For, because no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. The Lord has taken care of his church because we're his body. He nourishes us he, because he cherishes us. He, he longs to bless us. He longs to, uh, to, to give us what we need individually and our marriages to be able to see. You know why? Because he's wanting to represent us to himself. As the victorious church. And our marriages should show that. There are no perfect marriages just like there are no perfect churches. But there are some folk who are walking in this sanctified process. Bearing fruit unto the Lord with their marriages. Praise God. It ain't easy and it ain't always fun. Because we're still living in an old body that's corrupted by the fall in this old flesh but we have a savior and a holy spirit living in us who can make this work praise god your marriages can be symbolic of christ's relationship with the church he says that you ought to love your wives as your own bodies men because he that loves his wife loves himself Because no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. Notice that. The Lord nourishes and cherishes his church, and he is one with his bride. Therefore, we are to look at that example, and we're to know that we're one with our wives, and we're to nourish and to cherish them. The Bible calls our wives men a good thing. That's what he calls it, a good thing. you got a good thing if you got a Christian wife. You need to thank God and praise God for her every day. No, she's not perfect and neither are you. But we're in this thing together whether we like it or not. As Christians, we can be in this thing and walking in the triumphant victory of Jesus Christ. And that can be being seen by the community. Hallelujah. Those that get around you who got bad marriages, they ought to be able to see something that stirs their hearts that their marriage should be more than it is by looking and seeing Christ in your marriage. Hallelujah. Praise God for the opportunity to represent Christ with my marriage. Hallelujah. My marriage, not just me, my marriage should be a witness unto the Lord and a testimony to all that know me. They ought to be able to look at me how I treat my wife and say, man, I need to be closer to my wife. They ought to be able to look at my wife, Robin, and how she treats me and the way we get along together and knowing that we're not perfect, but they ought to be able to look at us and see something they need. 
Or just if they've got it, to be thankful that they have it. Praise God. He says, because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Oh, we need a deeper revelation of that. That we are the body. I mean, the body of Christ. He is our head. He's at the right hand of the Father. Don't get all flaked out and think that there's just a head floating up there by the Father and his body's on the earth. Don't get all flaked out. You got the man. I'm telling you, you got the man. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of all, seated at the right hand of his Father with his fingers and his feet, his head and everything. We're talking about authority here. He's the the head of the church, but we are his body. Indwelling us is his Holy Spirit. We have become the temple of God, the place that God dwells. Our feet carry him places. Our hands, he touches through our hands. When we lay hands on the sick and they recover, that is the Lord laying his hands on his people. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know the story of Paul, before he's Paul, he's Saul, he's on the way to Damascus to destroy more Christian lives because of their faith in this Jesus Christ. Knocked off his donkey by the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord asked him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me. He didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He says, why are you persecuting me? Do you see that? The Lord considers us one with Him in marriage like we're supposed to notice us with our Christian wives in union with them as one. And I got news for you. Even if your husband or your wife is not a Christian, you're still one. You have become one joined as one. Now the sanctification process is out of the picture. Can't work till you both get saved. But you can walk in it whether she or he does or not. Amen. 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 For we are his members of we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. I'm going to tell you this morning, we need a greater revelation of this. That we're not just here to do what we want to do. We are the literal body of Christ. Hey, I ain't talking about this old flesh. I'm talking about he dwells in us and will live and function with his power through us. Yet yeah, this old, this old uh, uh, dying fleshly body we have, he can use this body that he lives in. This old earthen vessel that's going to pass away very soon, there's an earthen, there is a treasure living in this earthen vessel. His name is Jesus. We are his body. The Bible says we're members of his body, his flesh, and of his bones. Amen. Amen. The resurrected body of Jesus Christ, that's who we are on this earth. We do not have our glorified bodies yet. That's obvious. Try walking through a wall, you'll get a knot on your forehead. It won't work unless it's a miracle, of course. But right now, the Bible says that as he is, so are we now. He's referring to not us now being perfect and without needing to pray, perfect and without needing to grow. He's talking about we are one with him, and when he sees us, he sees himself. He asked Saul, let me say it again, why are you persecuting me? When somebody's poking you in the eye, they're poking God in the eye. When somebody is persecuting you, they're persecuting Him. When they're hating you for your faith in the cross, they're hating Him. Doesn't matter if they say they're saved or not. Doesn't matter if they are saved. If they're hating this message, they're at enmity with God. He says in verse 31, because this, he says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. In the plan of God, in the mind of God, in the reality of God, in the way he sees it, and we need to see things the way he sees it, not what we think, we are one flesh. As husband and wife, we are one flesh. Because 
He is one flesh and body and bone with His church. If you look on down, he says in the next verse that this is a great mystery. Not just this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The, the overall picture of what he's teaching here is not just how a marriage can live in victory and represent Christ, but the overall picture here is how Christ is the head of the church. The church is his body. We're married to him. That's a great mystery, and we are one. Amen. Amen. But let me say something about verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too, the two of them, shall be one flesh. Let me say something, folks. If you're out there, you're debating on getting married, but you're about to marry someone who just can't get away from mom and daddy, that's not the one for you. That's not the one for you. If they can't leave mom and dad, and I'm not talking about there being a need there to tend to a sick mother and father, to tend to them, to be able to tend to them, to help them if something's wrong. I'm talking about those boys and those girls, those young men and young women who just say, no, I can't leave mom and dad. I've lived around them all my life. and I, Listen, they're not the one for you to marry. Well, you're being awful bold this morning trying to tell me who not. I'm not telling you anything except what God has said. We're talking about Christian men and women. We're not talking about lost people here. We're talking about Christians who have their faith in the cross and are directed by the Holy Spirit according to what God's plan is that we get from His Word. And if you got some gal, some guy claiming they're a Christian, praise God. If they claim they're saved, hallelujah for salvation. But if they're not willing to get away from mom and dad and, and, and be just at one with you and that not be enough, they're not the one for you. Amen, brother. And there's so many problems. He just can't get away from mama. She just can't move away from daddy and mama. They just got, they've got to have that tie, you know. But, you know, mom and daddy's been, they've been feeding us money. They've been funneling money. You know, maybe you got rich parents or something. And maybe the guy that you fell in love with and the Lord gave you in, as, as to, uh, to be husband, he just don't have the job your daddy had. And, and you, know, uh, you, know, if, you know, if you don't live right there, your daddy will quit funneling money. Get God's will is that you don't get the money from daddy no more that you become one flesh with him and you just get together with him trust God in your marriage if daddy wants to keep funneling money praise God for daddy and the money but you got to move on whether he gives that or not Amen. you got to get away yeah. not being ugly I'm just being real according to God's plan for your life Amen. you see that's what we need church we need to come back to God's plan for raising our kids. God's plan for our finances. God's plan for our marriages. God's plan for our health. God's plan is found in God's word. And if our faith is in what he said. We will experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Working out his plan in our lives. In our marriages. In our finances. In our health. In our everything. Praise God. But it's got to be according to the word of God. Because everything God does in our lives will be by faith on our part. And that means that not just faith in faith, faith in what God has said. See, we're not to perform it, and I love saying this because it's reality. We're to believe God's word, he will perform what he's promised. It's his word, it's his plan. If we believe what he said, he will perform his plan in our lives. Praise the Lord. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now see, first comes the love from the husband that cannot really happen. I'm ta this is Christian marriages. Amen. If you're married to a lost a husband, he can only love you to a certain point with a worldly love. With, it, may, it, it can be very emotional. It can be very real. It can be to the point he provides food and clothing and takes care of you. But it can never be with the love God will love you through him with because he doesn't have that love 
in his heart, Romans 5, 5, shed abroad in his heart if he's not born again. Doesn't mean he can't work and provide food for you, clothing for you. Doesn't mean he can't uh, 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 produce seed and, and, and you bear children together. Doesn't mean anything. But we're talking about a marriage that is symbolic here of Christ's relationship to the church. That's what Paul's writing about. He's not talking about just a good marriage. He's talking about a marriage that represents Christ, this great mystery of Christ and his bride, the church. And somebody said amen. amen. So, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, so love his wife even as himself. Remember, you got to love your wife as you love yourself. And again, that's not talking about, oh, I just love myself. I can't stay out of the mirror. I just love myself. I, just, I go to the gym and I just get in front of the mirror and I just look at myself all the time because I just love myself. It ain't talking about that. It's talking about what he's already discussed. You, you nourish and you cherish and you tend to your needs and you're to also do that for your wife. That's loving your wife. You're taking care of her like you take care of yourself. And God says that if we'll do that, then she will have that opportunity. Doesn't mean she'll have to, because she'll have to keep her faith in the atonement, the cross of Jesus Christ also, for the Holy Spirit to be able to empower her to reverence her husband, to submit to her husband. Amen. Without faith in the cross, none of this works for anybody. It does not just work, hallelujah. Well, I don't believe in all that cross stuff and God's doing this in my marriage. No, He's not. Amen. No, He's not. Psalms 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right. That means i got to get in the word. And all His works are done in truth. Amen. And the truth is a man named Jesus. And what he did at Calvary is what enables him to be my liberating, my powerful truth for living this life, sanctifying my marriage, training my children up in the way they should go, bringing all the provision into me, my marriage, my family, my church, my this, my... The cross is the avenue in which God pours out everything upon me through Christ. And anybody that says, I don't need all that cross stuff, your marriage is not... It's not being sanctified. Oh, I know they would get angry enough to carry me out here and bury me in a 10-foot hole and stand on me till I suffocated. I'm telling you, they would be that mad at hearing this because they just can't stand to know that it's all wrapped up in the cross, bless God. It's based on what we're doing today. And let me tell you something. You can't do anything in the Word of God and God consider it obedience unless your faith is in the cross, which is what He said is the only thing that makes you obedience in His eyes. Romans chapter 6. So for our marriages to be able to walk in a place of sanctification, there's got to be a walking by faith in the Word, in truth, which points to the cross, and then God can build our marriage. He can build our house, and we won't be laboring in vain. And somebody said, Amen. Praise God. How Hallelujah. We are learning great, great things. We're living in the last days. God's pouring out of His Spirit. He's increasing knowledge as He said He would through the prophet Daniel. And it's not just in technology and computers and you're able to have your office in your pocket now. Make a call, take a picture, email, text, Facebook. I mean right there in the palm of your hand you can reach the world. But I'm telling you, the greatest increase of knowledge is that of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. His knowledge, His grace offered to me. There is an increase right now that God is pouring out among those who have ears to hear, those that will repent and come back to faith and grace, come back to their first works. I didn't say this church or that church. I said back to the faith, back to the grace of God, which is faith in the cross alone. And let every golden calf be dead as Satan planted it and began it. Let it go back where it came from and let us walk in faith and victory that can only come through faith in Christ. Christ and what he did at Calvary. I thank God that God uh, uh, chose Paul and put Paul in many places of hardship, shipwrecked, stone left for dead, beat fast, living in caves without, just so that he could work through Paul and get the gospel to all the world, praise God, so that we wouldn't be ignorant on why our marriages aren't working, but we could get in the Word and see why they're not working and also see the way that God will make them work. I said, He, God can make your marriage work. I don't care if you're on the edge of divorce right now. If you're both saved, God can make it work. 
God can make it work. And listen to this, even better news. Every, if you'll just come back to the cross, God will allow you to erase. He will erase everything in your past, all the flaws of that marriage, all the hardships, all the sin. And He will allow you to behold yourselves as a brand new creation in Him, as one together in unity, being sanctified for the purpose of representing Him and His relationship with the church. And your marriage can once again become that testimony to all that know you. I don't care if they never forget your big pieces of stupid you committed. God will and you can. Hallelujah. I said God will and you can. And we've all done dumb stuff. But by the grace of God, that means by faith in the cross, grace comes and God begins to work and God takes His big eraser that's dripping with the blood of Jesus and He erases everything in our past and says, what I erase, I can't remember, I can't see you and you as husband and wife. You're brand new all over again today. Just as clean as you were when you got married. Hallelujah. And it's just going to get better by the day. With or without all the mistakes. I got news for you. Let Jesus be Lord and your marriage will be what He intended it on being. Hallelujah. If, if, if your purpose and your desire is to please God more than it is yourself, then God can be the God of your marriage. Hallelujah. I didn't say if your desire was for Him or her more than for yourself. I said if your desire is to please God more than it is for yourself or for your spouse, then God can move in that house and God can work in that house and God can bless that house because He can't bless a house out of order. Amen. He's commanded let everything be done decently and in order and we've read the Word of God concerning what He says a marriage is decent and in order if it's according to His Word. So if we'll just get back to the Word of God with our faith in the cross of Christ and I have to add that because let me tell you something husband and wife just because your marriage is on the brink of divorce and you sit down and open the Bible and read what you're supposed to do and he's supposed to do and you say we're going to do this I got news for you you're not going to do it but if you will take your faith make the object of your faith in the deepest part of who you are in your heart that is and you say that Jesus died to save me Jesus died for my marriage to be what it should be and you leave your faith in the cross and you quit listening to all these teachers and preachers who point to everything but the cross then God will bless your marriage and then your children not before then God can't train your children up in the way they should go in an unsanctified marriage because He doesn't train our children up in the way they should go based on what we tell them, but what we believe and live according to the Word. Because our kids don't listen to what we say, they listen to what we do. They watch mom and dad. They see that mom and dad love each other. They love Jesus greater than anything. And when problems come, they take it to the Lord. That means they get in the Word. This is what God's Word said. And if I ain't getting my way in this, you know what? I lost my way when I found His way. Praise God. I'm not looking for my way anymore. And I get hard-headed like all of you. And I want this to be right the way I want it to work. But then and I, if, if I'm really honest and I want God's way first, I've got to let my way go. And God will show you His way, but the first thing you got to do is let your way go. Especially men that say, well, this God just don't like being wrong. It makes it look like, you know, she, 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 how's she going to submit to me if I'm wrong? You're going to be wrong lots of times. But so is she. Because we're talking about imperfect people. That the Lord can show up. And even in our imperfections, He can be glorified. There can be fruit as we trust Him and His plan. Him and His plan, praise God. I've loved the teaching on Ephesians up to this point. Five chapters we've covered, and we could have taught on the first chapter as long as we've taught all five of them. There's that much meat in, in, in this Bible. There, there, there is so much that could be taught. And it's all about Jesus. You see, I'm thankful today to be in a ministry that doesn't just use that phrase just haphazardly. 
When I say it's all about Jesus, I mean it's all about Jesus. Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. Jesus created everything. Jesus is the judge of everything. Jesus is the redeemer of all that will be redeemed. And Jesus will judge and cast into hell all those that have rejected Him. He is the creator. He is the judge. He is everything to all. Whatever that is. It's been our pleasure to make it this far through the book of Ephesians. To, to learn and to grow along together with those who have ears to hear. With those that are speaking the same thing. Not just running around believing what they want to. And then trying to find a scripture to justify what they believe. But getting in the word and seeing what God has said. And following what he said. Amen. Amen. So don't forget to share this broadcast. Don't forget to let other people know they can tune in here every week and hear the Word of God taught in truth. That, man, if you don't, if you are just listening to somebody who's reading the Word of God to you, declaring the Word of God to you, and it's not in truth, that means in Christ and what He did at Calvary in that context, then there there are preachers who are holding the Word of God in unrighteousness and in all reality, His wrath is against them. Join us right here next time. God bless you. We love you. Tell somebody about this broadcast. Praise God.